Okay. All right, Frank, it's on to you. Great. Uh, hello, everybody. I wanted to thank you all for joining me today. I also wanted to thank the Clemson Center for Corporate Learning, uh, as well as uh, Nan uh, Johnson and Sally, um, who's going to be helping me out today. Um, just a little background on myself. Um, I have about 40 years experience in the nonprofit sector. I, uh, 32 of those years were with the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society, in which I was an executive director for about 10 years. I was a um, regional vice president for approximately 10 years, and then I was an interim executive director for about 10 years. And um, what I did, uh, you know, just um, the reason um, I'm sorry, my, it's okay. The reason my <laughs> company is, <laughs> whoa, the reason my company is um, called Smoke Jumper uh, is because that was a name that was given to me when I was an interim executive director by one of my supervisors. So I would go into chapters that maybe didn't have an executive director and were, were in a, either some crisis or a period of transition. And I would go in and kind of keep the ship running, smooth things out, solve some problems. So with that, um, I'd like to go to the next slide if I could, Sally, and just talk about the objectives. Um, I'm hoping that you will leave this session with more questions than answers. I hope that I will be able to um, stimulate you in a way that you will want to dig a little deeper and find out, you know, what you need to do to prepare for post-COVID planning. Um, what I'll, the objectives will be is to define what the post-COVID world looks like. Um, we're going to talk about the planning process and the major components of that. And then also we're going to talk about some tools that will help you in your day-to-day -day. Um, as well as then I want to open it up for questions. And if I don't have the answers, I'd welcome anyone else to come in and share their experiences uh, as far as being able to um, help out. Um, recently, I attended a conference uh, virtually, a peer-to-peer -peer conference, and a lot of the time was spent on people talking um, about how horrible 2020 was and what they had to do to pivot. The, the word pivot kept coming up. And it went on and on, and I kept saying, what's next? What are we going to do next? And that's why I wanted to put this presentation together, because I, in my research and what I've done, um, I'm finding that you know there is another pivot coming. There is another uh, change that we're going to have to make as we come out of this. And what I'd like to do is just help you get some tools, get some perspective, um, and get some idea of where you want to go and what your plan is as you come out of um, this, this uh, COVID-19 world. What I've seen is there are pretty, pretty much three buckets, three schools of thought that people are, are kind of clinging to in this. And they're talking about as things go on, some people are thinking that things have changed forever, uh, that things are um, going to be different no matter what. Some people say that we're going to go back to normal. Um, I've got one foot in that camp. And another one is another thought is that we're going to be going to um, the hybrid uh, positioning in which we're looking at a way of life, a way of doing events, a way of raising money, a way of doing business that will be a little bit different than what we did before, but it's also going to be very similar to what we did before. And I, I kind of subscribe to that. So in my research, I came up with um, like some general themes that came out with a lot of articles that I read about this. And what I'd like to do is kind of share those with you. Um, if we could go to the next slide. There we go. And in, in defining the, um, sorry, I just have to get, there we go. So in, uh, in looking at this, it's as you're coming out of the post-COVID world, as you're going into the post-COVID world, I'm sorry, and as you're coming out of where we've been the last 14 months, um, there are some things that I want you to look at, some things that I want you to think about, and that's the list here. So the first one is, what's your message going to be? Um, I hope your message currently is not one of, G 2020 was really hard. We really had to make some cutbacks. We really had a lot of challenges. I hope your message is gonna be forward looking, forward thinking, um, and that you're going to be looking at trying to um, 
talk about the future and ways the organization is going to grow. Another one, another Frank, I think you're um, uh, freezing up on us a little bit. Are you Sally? there? There we yeah, go. Yeah, I am. <laughs> okay. We okay? Yeah, we're good now. All right. Um, so anyway, um, one of is about communicating with your staff, your volunteers, your board, and your donors. And in this case, you know, it's communicating where you're at, communicating your plan as you know it, as it develops, and also asking for input. Um, I think it would be really smart if you had conversations with your donors and not ask for money, but just ask for how they are dealing with the current situation. What are their thoughts about where we're going? And just have a conversation with them. Later on, you can ask for support and that'll be a lot easier. Um, another one, another theme was to capitalize on your forced efficiencies, meaning that we had to make a lot of adjustments. We had to pivot in the first part of, um, of this, and that we were forced to make some cuts, we were forced to do without some things. Look at that and, and see how your business has responded to that. If you really do miss not having a bookkeeper, if you really do miss not having an administrative assistant, if you really do miss not having certain things that you missed out, your, that you had to cut. Because what you can do then is as you come out of this, you can build onto it with more, uh, maybe more fundraising or maybe more programming instead of going back to adding the administrative la the administrative layer that you that you had. Um, another theme was to, and this was a strong one, was to cooperate with your competition, and this was specific to mission delivery. It wasn't in regards to fundraising because that's that's pretty hard to do. But in looking at, again, creating efficiencies, stopping any program duplication, and looking to cooperate with your competition to make sure that you're still reaching your clientele or you're still uh, achieving what your organization is meant to achieve, but, but you're not competing in the mission space. Um, I'm sure all of us were forced to do things differently in regards to fundraising, whether we moved more towards a virtual um, act, um, virtual way of doing business or to look at um, doing fewer events and more uh, in-person um, one-on-one -on -one fundraising as far as doing donor solicitation. Embrace that and don't, don't say, oh, we're going to go back to special events so I can stop doing donor development. I would keep donor development as part of your portfolio and really try to keep that going because the more diverse your portfolio is, the more stable you're going to be. Your mission has been relevant since day one. It was relevant before COVID hit and it's still relevant now. And you need to make sure everybody understands that. I remember when 9-11 occurred and the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society, you know, people were still getting blood cancers and we still had to say, our mission is relevant. We're still fighting a battle and we had to go on and do our business. So, you know, really look at how your mission or how your mission um, delivery has changed for the better and really trumpet that, really, really build up with that. Um, we talk about pivoting and we, let's say we pivoted 90 degrees when all of this hit and we had to change a lot of things. I would look at the possibility of pivoting back 75 to 80 percent, um, that you're going to go back to the way things were, but there are going to be some changes. There are going to be some things that are different. Um, this is something that Sally was just talking about where, you know, they're looking at going back to their office soon. So there's now this been ongoing debate or a lot of discussion about working remotely versus not remotely. And I have to tell you, I am part of the old school. I'm part of the old camp on this. And then I believe in uh, having an office. I believe in having a fiscal presence. 
uh, and having a place where the, the public can see that you have a presence in the community. And I also believe in your team coming together and working together and having that synergy and being able to go down the hallway and say, hey, I've got an idea, I wanna kick this around with you. There's a synergy that you lose when everybody is, is uh, working in a remote situation. So really look at the pluses and the, and the negatives on allowing people to work from home all of the time. Maybe there's a schedule you work out, but you really need to have your team together. Um, and this is one of those things that it's gonna be gradual and there's gonna be a transition and it may not come back to everybody is in the office nine to five, Monday through Friday, but they need to be, you need to have your team together and you need to have um, the human interaction. You need to be able to see um, your, your people. I just wanted to take a quick look at history and kind of draw a parallel if I could. And it's a very uh, broad parallel. And, and I know there are a lot of differences between what happened now and what happened 100 years ago. But between 1918 and 1920, uh, the US population was about 103 million people. Uh, and they lost um, 675,000 um, people to influenza. There were no vaccines. Uh, eventually they hit a herd, um, uh, they hit, um, I'm, I'm scrambling for the word, they had um, herd immunity mm -hmm. and um, they, uh, you know, the things kind of calmed down a little bit in 1920. And what happened after uh, 1920 was the Roaring Twenties in which every time you see photographs or pictures of the Roaring Twenties, you're seeing crowds, you're seeing nightclubs, you're seeing football games, you're seeing parades um, and life came back and became normal, uh, uh, so to speak again. Um, I feel like that's something that's going to occur here. Because if you think about it, the way we developed our current way of doing life, of, of living life, was based on the 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s on up. So this was a, something that occurred uh, and it became the way that we live our lives through um, having large groups of people being able to come together. So in my mind, when we talk about things like special events, they are gonna come back. And how much, how fast, I don't know. But here's what I do know. Uh, some people think that events are gonna come back and they're going to go um, full bore. They're gonna hit really hard and there's gonna be a huge spike in, in events. And people are gonna be hungry for this and hungry for this activity. And then what they're gonna do is they think that it's gonna taper off and die down a little bit. I'm not even sure about that. I think that if you can position yourself to get back into the special event world and do it uh, sooner than later, that you'll be one of the ones better positioned to maximize on this, this enthusiasm and this, uh, this new uh, this excitement that people are going to have to get out. And whether it's walk in a walk, go to a black tie, go to a regatta, whatever it is, people are going to want to get out and they're going to want to support uh, support a cause. Um, as you may notice, um, I have less hair on my head than um, I did in my promotional photo. And uh, what I want to do is share with you an experience I had in, in, in regards to the fundraising. Um, and I was, um, I'm proud to say that I, I shaved my head in support of St. Baldrick's uh, Foundation and supported cancer research. And I went and signed up for this and I wanted to go to an event in Colombia and have my head shaved after I raised money. Um, and the, um, I started my fundraising and the event was moved from late March to July, which is fine. And so I had my website and I was working with the staff. The staff was extremely responsive. This was something that they focused on and did a great job of is when I had a question, they were back to me within 24 hours. They wanted to make sure they were supporting me. So my fundraising experience was excellent and I raised more money than I've ever raised before for any other thing I've done. And that's encouraging, that should, that's encouraging. But what happened was um, I decided to go and do a virtual event. So um, I had chosen my date, I was gonna stick with that and I did that. And so uh, my girlfriend and I, um, had a little wine and then we just shaved my head. And I don't recommend you drink and shave your head. It's not really a, a great thing. You, I had to make some repairs the next day. 
But so we did that. And so what happened with that was that instead of having an event, it was sort of a little anticlimactic. And it's no through no fault of, of the organization that I was supporting. It's just the way things went in this world. So what did I miss out on? And let's, let's look at that. I missed out on being with like people that have the same um, interests that I do, that have the same uh, uh, support of the cause that I believe in. I missed remembering my father who passed away from cancer. Uh, I missed out on being recognized. And again, they've been more than gracious in recognizing me privately, and that's fine. But it's that, that recognition in a group, being with folks that have the same cause you do, and also being able to either celebrate or grieve or have hope. These are things that nonprofit special events do for our supporters. And these are things that they are going to be craving and you need to make sure that when your events come back, you have these things there for them to, to, uh, to feel and enjoy and be part of. So that's, that's um, that. So Sally's on to the next slide. <laughs> so let's talk about the post-COVID planning process. And I love this quote from Dwight Eisenhower, and it's plans are useless, but planning is everything. And I, I really agree with that because... Um, you know, you can have the best plan in the world, but then the minute you hit send on this or put it in your computer, it's already outdated um, because life happens. Things change. People come and go. So what that means is the planning process is super important for you to know what you need to get done. It just doesn't matter sometimes the, the uh, sequence or the order that all of these things get done as long as they do get done. So there's a four-step process as far as I'm concerned, and that's Assess, plan, implement, assess, and then repeat. And assessing is super, super important because you need to always know where you are at, what do you need, and how are you going to get it? And then you move on to the next phase of your plan. So assessment, the, um, I, I, I really believe that to get started, you need to do a deep audit and a deep resource assessment. And what you can do on this is compare uh, wherever you want to draw the line as far as when COVID really impacted your organization. Let's say it's January of 2020. You can look at um, 2020, you know, January, compare it to now, April 21st, and then pick a date in the future where you feel we may be coming out of this, whether it's 122, 422, whatever it is you want to look at. And so when you're doing that, you're going to say, let's say we're talking about staffing. You're going to say, okay, I had 10 staff in January of 2020. Now I've got seven, but what do I want in a year? What do I want? And that's where we need to get you to go and, and have a plan so that you can uh, focus on where you want to be, not, not to get back to 120. You don't want to go back to where you were. You want to go back to where you want to be. You need to have an objective look at everything. And what do I mean by everything? I mean everything from administrative processes to your fundraising schedule, your portfolio, your board components, uh, your board makeup, um, your programming, your mission, uh, and your mission delivery. How has that changed? Everything is on the table and everything needs to get needs to get looked at. Even the territory that you're covering, does that need to change? Again, the plan doesn't have to happen in sequential order, but it needs to happen. So what do I mean by that? Let's say we're talking about a walk. And the most important thing for you to do, the first thing to do is to secure a walk chair. But yet that's hard to do. And sometimes that takes time. You still have to put your committee together. You still have to go out and get corporate sponsors. You still have to go out and recruit last year's teams. So the walk needs to continue while you're looking for your chairman. You can't stop everything because you didn't get the first thing done. It all has to just happen. Um, the planning process is ongoing. It's a journey and a destination. And what do I mean by that? Um, it, to me, it's an ongoing process. So if you are going to do a plan and then print it out and put it on your shelf, then you're not doing anybody any good. Your plan, either it's on your computer and it's up all the time, or it's on your desk and it's printed out and it's dog-eared and it's been looked at a lot. 
And it's a living document. It's changing all the time because things do change. So the plan has to be something that you're going back to and, and referring to. It's not, oh, I got my annual plan done. Phew, I'm just gonna put it up on the shelf. And just another, uh, you know, just finally, um, while your organization is in a democracy, uh, there's a hierarchy there. Um, the more inclusive you are, the more people you include in the planning process, the stronger the plan is gonna be. Um, not only because there's gonna be an increased buy-in by everyone that's involved, but you're gonna get some really great feedback from the people that are actually gonna be implementing the plan. Okay, Sally, next uh, slide, please. So components of the assessment. And what I wanna do here is look at all of the parts of the assessment and then actually uh, ask some questions and not give you answers, but ask some questions about what you should be looking at when you're taking this apart. So let's talk about your fundraising portfolio. And again, where were you, where are you now, and where are you going? Um, there are certain parts of your fundraising portfolio, I'm sure that you're itching to get back into uh, to, um, in to implement, um, and that's going to be up to you how and when you do that. Um, there's probably some parts of your fundraising portfolio that have grown and developed, and you want to hold on to that. You want to keep that discipline. If you were increasing your donor development and increasing your personal solicitation of donors, you want to keep that discipline. You want to keep that going. Um, staffing. You know, your staffing model, uh, as I mentioned before, you may have started out with 10 people, you're down to seven, but you actually want to get back to hiring two more positions. The, the staff structure may change dramatically. You may have eliminated an administrative uh, part of your, of your staff, and you're doing all right without that administrative part of your staff. So that frees you up to hire another fundraising person. And may, or another program person, whatever it is that you feel like you need. Your volunteer structure is one where um, you have the ability to reinvent and re, uh, rewrite job descriptions. And so you can look at your board structure and maybe you're looking at the role of the board. You can create committees, you can take let committees, um, maybe they're, they're no longer functioning as, as they need to, and maybe they need to go away. Um, you have go-to volunteers, and these are folks that are neither are on a committee or on your board, but you go to them all the time. And they don't wanna be part of a structured group, but they're gonna do whatever they can to help you, and they're gonna, they're gonna be part of your uh, inner core. Those, are, those folks are okay. And, and what you wanna do with them is make sure, number one, they're appreciated, but also that you're continuing to use them to the best of, of their capacity. Um, internships is a big one where a lot of uh, internship, internship programs have either gone away or they're on hold, but I would look at trying to bring those back. And I'll tell you something, an internship program may be a little more work for you. However, it, it is such a great um, they're such a great resource. Uh, college students that are coming in um, have so many great skills, and also it's a great bullpen for future staff members. Your mission and your programming, um, you need to look at how has our mission changed, how have the needs of our clientele changed, how, um, what do they need now, where is their duplication, where is there a program need that we're not even uh, in the ballpark yet, and you need to look at that. Um, your event calendar. And when I talk about events, uh, obviously I'm talking about fundraising. I'm talking about your programming. I'm also talking about public awareness events, which sometimes there's not dollars attached, but you're out there sowing the seeds for, for greater awareness for your organization, as well as internal events. Um, and these are going to be much more important as we all come back into the workplace. And by internal events, that could be anything from um, you know, a volunteer appreciation dinner or some kind of outing, um, staff, regular staff uh, celebratory outings, because you need to celebrate your successes with your staff. Um, in fact, one of the articles I read talked about when you bring your people back, when everybody's kind of coming back into the office, you need to do something. You need to have a party of some kind and celebrate the fact that you made it through the pandemic 
and you're still together as a team and you're still moving forward. So think about that. And I don't, you know, it could be anything, whatever your culture of your office dictates, whether it's donuts and coffee, or if it's a happy hour, or if it's lunch, uh, whatever it is, bring your people together and really thank them and celebrate the fact that, that you all are all still together. Um, your website and your social media. And this is a big one because we all spend a lot of money driving people to our website. And yet sometimes websites are outdated. They're not kept up. The calendar dates are wrong. Um, the financial information is wrong. And you really need to go on your own website on a regular basis and try to sign up for one of your events. Try to um, go in and find out more information about your programs. How easy is it? Do you have the right information up there? Um, I went on some websites recently and I was kind of shocked to find that there wasn't a COVID-19 uh, message. There wasn't any kind of mention that of, of what's going on or how the organization is dealing with it. So really look at, look at that. Um, one of the um, things I wanna to talk to you about is territory and market coverage. And this is important because again, this is an opportunity for you to really look at the territory you have and are you maximizing it both in fundraising and in program delivery. So what do I mean by that? Let's, um, when I was the executive director for South Carolina, I had the whole state. So I did a lot of activities in Columbia when I first got there. And I, I was very, we were very successful in Columbia, but then I quickly realized I could maximize Greenville, Spartanburg and Charleston. And so what I did was I invested in the, um, the time and the talent to go out and be in those markets. So I have a saying and it says, if you're gonna go there, be there. And if you're gonna be there, go there. And what that means is that if you're gonna go into Greenville, you have to, and you're, you're based in Columbia and you're gonna go into Greenville, number one, you have to invest the time and the travel to go there. And then the second thing is whatever I do in Columbia, I have to do in Greenville, I have to commit to do the same things. And trust me, uh, once you do that, and once you say we are in Greenville, the, the results come back to you, both in programming and also in, um, in fundraising, it's amazing. So when I left the, um, the, um, the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society South Carolina chapter, when I was promoted to the national office, I had come in and the chapter was at about $400,000 in income. When we went and, and grew the other markets, we were, when I left, it was at close to $2 million in income. And Charleston was responsible for half of our income, $1 million out of Charleston. And again, we had to make the commitment. We had to throw a lot of time and talent into that, but it sure did pay off. Uh, administratively, uh, I am not, <laughs> I am not a big fan of administrative stuff. And so when I look at something um, administratively, it's super necessary, it's important, and you have to have it. However, we have to try to keep the administrative part down uh, to be as lean and, and, um, and uh, efficient as possible. And I'll give you an example of that. So looking at my slide, we're going to talk about, you know, we can talk about updating your procedures, um, your documents and your protocols in regards to COVID-19, and that's fine. But then I would look at all of your processes and say, do I need this? Is this important? And who does this benefit? So I'll give you an example. We had a situation where there was a nonprofit who did a monthly forecast. And to do this monthly forecast, the staff had to stop what they were doing for about two to three days and do this forecast every month. Well, then we found out that nobody was reading the forecast. So if that's going to happen, why are we doing this? Stop the madness. So we did, do, we did stop that. We had to um, go to a quarterly forecast, which was much more efficient, and, and still we still had the same benefit. And I guess what I'm saying is, is that if you're going to be asking for data and asking for input and asking for people to stop what they're doing to give you information, 
make sure you're using the information. Okay, that's my, that's my little piece on that. Uh, the next uh, slide, please. So the planning process. Um, everybody does this a little bit differently. So whatever works for you, I would take a look at some of these points and try to incorporate them in there. And, and again, every organization is structured a little bit differently with how they interact with their volunteers. So one is that, I, again, I believe in having all staff involved at some point, not at the highest levels, but at some point in the planning process because they are gonna be the ones implementing it. I would also say uh, to bring in a facilitator when you finally get to really putting the plan together. Uh, they're impartial, they can put, they can keep the process on track. Um, using a parking lot uh, is really important. And a parking lot to me is a uh, flip chart that's on the side. And when you're talking about your walk and the growth of your walk and someone says, hey, I want to do, uh, I think we need to do a regatta. You say, okay, that's great. We're going to put that on the parking lot and we'll get back to it. Because if you don't do that kind of thing, the person that wants to talk about regatta is not going to focus and they're not going to be part of the meeting and you've lost that person. So the parking lot is awesome because it's a great place for you to just drop a lot of great ideas that come through the planning process. Some organizations plan with the staff and then the board. Sometimes they go with the staff and the board and sometimes they plan with the board and then the staff. Whatever works for you, uh, is going to be what's going to have to work. You can decide and have a pretty rough draft of your plan um, it, after meeting with some of your key personnel, whether they're volunteers or staff, and, and know the direction you want to go into and then build from there. Um, one thing I have found to be very successful is when you're working with the board and the volunteers on the planning process is to really focus on the areas that they can directly implement. And I'll give you an example. At the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society, we had several programs that the volunteers really weren't involved in. And so we would not plan with the volunteers about, you know, we would ask for their input, but we didn't really draw them into that. What we focused on were the things like Light the Night or Walk. Um, we focused on donor development. We focused on Man and Woman of the Year, things where they were volunteer heavy, volunteer driven, and they could directly impact. And it was, it was very effective. Um, obviously setting timelines, deliverables and due dates and assignments uh, to specific people are, is key, but it's something that you, if you have a good facilitator, they will make sure this occurs throughout the process. And you don't wanna move on from one topic to another without making sure you have this set up. Um, or else uh, it's just going to fade because nobody's going to own it and no one's going to know to uh, follow up on it. Um, that being said, I would always have the plan be on my agenda at board meetings and at staff meetings and have report outs. Uh, just a simple thing of let's do an update on the plan. Where are we? Where are we on the walk? Where are we on the mission delivery? Where are we? And just make sure that this is part of your culture, that it's constantly being brought up. So be prepared to hear things that may make you happy. Be prepared things that may amaze you uh, in a good way when you know, you finding out that maybe you had resources uh, that you didn't know you had and now you're able to go in a new direction. Um, be prepared to hear things that may make you sad. Uh, whereas maybe uh, the board support isn't there for a key initiative or maybe some of the support you had, thought you had, isn't there. Um, but just be prepared to hear things that, um, you know, you're gonna find out a lot about your organization uh, when, when you do do this. Um, follow up and accountability is all, or Dwight Eisenhower has it, has it right. Uh, next slide, please. So tools to help you. I wanted to just cover a couple of things. I'm checking on my time. Okay, we're doing all right. Um, I wanted to focus on some tools to help you. And this is more or less with your day-to-day -day, um, day -day work. 
And what this is, um, uh, this is a connector meeting, and this is a way for you to find out what resources you have, what connections you have, and then how to follow up with them uh, really accurately and in a timely manner. So I'll give you an example. I'll tell you two stories. One, I used to, as the interim executive director, I used to go into markets where I had never been before. I had no contacts. And I was expected to make sure that the Man Woman of the Year campaign was on track. That's a fundraising program where we would recruit uh, fundraisers who could raise anywhere between fifty dollars to $100,000. So I had to go into a city where I didn't know anybody, and I had to find these people. So what did I do? I would first start with the staff, and I would get the staff to meet. And I would say, okay, there's going to be um, some pre-work, and we've got to get together and find these people. And I'll, and I'll go into that in a little more detail. Another story is when I was uh, a teacher assistant many, many years ago, um, one of my jobs was to unpack the supplies that came in, all the school supplies for the school. So I would take some students with me and we would go into the storeroom and unpack the supplies. And I would take my car keys, this is back when we had car keys, and I would take my car keys and hack the box and I would be opening the box and hacking the boxes. So I open up one box and I hand it to the students. They said, put this stuff on the shelf. And one of the students said, Mr. Canning, this is a box of scissors. You've been unpacking scissors. And I said, yeah. And he says, why don't you use the scissors from the first box to open the rest of the boxes? So that's a symbol for us to say, you may have boxes of scissors around and you haven't unpacked them yet. So in looking at that, that's what this exercise does for you. So let's say you have a walk and you want to um, have, you want to get a walk chair, you want to get corporate sponsors and you want to get um, committee members. So your, your meeting, your connector meeting has to be project specific and need specific. You send pre-work out to all your, your participants. So let's say the meeting participants are six staff members. And they're going to bring lists to the meeting of people they work with, people they live near, people they do business with, people that they know, okay? And what we want to do is we want to connect and not network. We do not want name dumping because what we don't want to someone to say is, hey, do you know Bill Thompson? No. Oh, he'd be great. Well, do you know Bill Thompson? No. Then it's, it, it doesn't matter. It just, it's just an empty name. So what, what, how we come around that, how we get around that is that the person who suggests the candidate has to make the first contact and introduce them to the staff member. So if I suggest a candidate, I'll make the connection and say, hey, our walk director really wants to talk to you about the walk. So the staff in the charge of the meeting, they initially follow up with the participants and they are the ones that are following up with the leads that they develop. And how we record this is at the bottom there, you see prospect, contact, uh, connection, next step, due date, and result. And what this is, is it's pretty much an Excel spreadsheet. And the person, let's say your walk director is going to keep charge of it. This is their meeting. They're going to keep track of this meeting. So the prospect is Bill Thompson. The contact is Frank Canning. The connection is that Frank and Bill play basketball every Wednesday. The next step is that Frank's going to talk to Bill next Wednesday, and the due date is next Thursday. And then I come back, you follow up with me, and I give you the result after I talk to Bill. It's super simple. It is super simple, but it's very effective. And this is a, a type of meeting that you can do uh, several times a year for different programs. You can do one for board development. You can do one for um, corporate sponsorship. You can do one for your gala. You can do one for any type of an event or program that you have. If you're looking at people to think out from where their sphere of, of uh, influence is um, and to, um, to be able to go out and reach out. And it's been, it was remarkably effective when, um, when I did it uh, with the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society. Okay. So, um, Next slide, please. So this priority setting tool is one that will help you set your priorities over multiple projects. And what that means is, you know, we had 
at the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society, we had executive directors and staff that were just getting bombarded with lots of different things that everybody wanted them to do. And I said, you know what, we need a workbook in which they can prioritize the priorities. And that means you set your priorities and then you set them again and take the top level of those off uh, and work on them. So um, it's an ongoing document. You update it every week. It's an Excel, yeah, Excel spreadsheet for every major project that you have. So there might be one for your walk. There might be one for your black tie. Might be one for your programming. There might be one for your golf tournament. And what you want to do with that is you're going to set the priorities and weigh them. And then you're going to talk about the dollar impact or in the case of programming, the number of people impacted. And then you talk about um, the steps you need to take and the barriers. And what this does for you, now this is not a to-do list for the whole program. This is a to-do list just for you and the role that you play in this program. So if I'm the executive director and I have a walk director, the walk director is, uh uh-oh. Did I disappear? Am I okay? All right, good, okay. So what you wanna do is, just focus on the four things that you do for the walk to make it successful. So that might be solicit a chairman, go after major corporate sponsors, recruit teams, whatever that may be. But that's your piece of the walk. The walk director is going to look at the minutia and they're going to secure teams and they're going to do whatever it is they do. That's their, that's their deal. So when you do this, you're going to go through and you're going to have, you know, tasks and due dates and it's, it's very simple. But The key on this is the last page. And the last page is a summary of the top needs of the previous pages. And what that means is you go back and look at your first eight pages and you're gonna take the three three or four things or two or three things that were the most heavily weighted and say, okay, these are things I have to get done this week. I need to do these. The things that have a lesser weight are gonna move up in weight as we get down the line. But right now, I'm going to take two things from each of these pages. I'm going to put it on the final page. And that's your to-do list. That's where your focus is for the next week. And you can update that. Um, you can update that weekly. Okay, next, uh, next page, please. Okay, so we're in the home stretch. We're almost done. Um, I kind of want to wrap things up by asking some more questions. So, um, again, looking at the plan for the next... 12 to 18 months for you, this is an opportunity to either reinvent or make adjustments. It's a huge opportunity. And what does that mean? Uh, It might mean adding a market. It might mean changing a program or redesigning a program. Um, It might mean dropping an event. Now, let's talk about that. So you've got special events that you're going to be trying to bring back. And Sometimes we have events that we might not want to bring back, So, but there's an emotional attachment to them. So, for example, if there's a golf tournament that you've done for 20 years and it drives you crazy and it raises like $5,000, here's your opportunity to say, you know what, we've got to go in another direction. If a third party wants to do this event and give us the net check, that's okay, but we're not going to be investing staff time and talent and our resources in this event at this time. We just can't do it because we're, we're too lean and uh, we're too close to the bone. So with that, knowing that you're going to be sacrificing this $5,000 golf tournament, you can add new events. And when I say add new events, don't put the pressure on you uh, or your staff to come up with the new ice bucket challenge. Just don't do it. Um, it, it's, it who knows if it's out there? You know, this was the ice bucket challenge was this huge success and, and, and blew the doors off of everything. Um, don't put that pressure on yourself. Look at, see what type of events you have, see what resources, again, that you have. And you might be able to come up with a new event idea or re- resurrect an old event or do copy another nonprofit in another market to do an event that makes sense for you. But don't feel like you have to hit a home run out of the park. Adding staff and changing staff makeup. Again, you can look to the future and say, what does my dream team look like? What does my dream team look like? Um, adding committees, you know, my belief is that sometimes committees get a lot done. They are very effective uh, and they're, they're, they're great. And 
if you have an event that needs help, consider putting in a committee around it, uh, even if it hasn't had one in the past. Um, this is also an opportunity for you to redefine your board membership and the role. And you can you know, talk to your board members about that as far as, let's say if you had a more, a more of a policymaking board that was making a lot of policies, making a lot of decisions, you can turn that around and say, we need a fundraising board now. We need a board that's gonna focus more on fundraising. It's gonna focus more on uh, implementing and getting resources to the organization. And here's what the new board membership looks like. So uh, jumping down, um, there are a lot of times when um, at the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society, we had a network across the country of similar offices. You know, we had all, like 60 chapter offices. So we were able to reach out and find out and network how they did it. Um, how did you have a successful you know, gala? How did you have a successful running event? Um, and able, we were able to pick each other's brains. Sometimes with smaller nonprofits, you don't have that luxury because you're out there alone. But it's okay to reach out to other states to similar organizations and exchange information. So that's why I say, how do they do it in North Carolina, Georgia, New York, or Charleston? Let's say you're a small nonprofit up in Greenville and you've heard about this awesome event they're doing down in Charleston. Call them up. You're not competing directly with them. And you know you can share some information with them. They'll share information with you. Um, and it's, it's super helpful. Um, I've found an organization I'm working with, they're just go on it alone. And I said, my gosh, there's so many similar organizations. Let's go find out how they do it. Um, your organization may be more compact when you come out of this, and that's okay, because it's, you want it to be larger in reach uh, and impact, um, but it's not going to look the same as it did. Um, sometimes you need a third party, you know, someone like me to come in um, and to ask the questions that no one's asking or that haven't thought to ask. Uh, sometimes, you know, someone like myself can come in and ask the painful questions or obvious questions or not obvious questions where I could come in and say, well, how come you do ABC? And you're like, well, we have DEF. And I'm like, well, you need, you know, you need X, Y, Z. So the other, the other thing is um, sometimes it pays to have somebody come in and say the things you've been saying over and over again, but when they come from another source, they get attention. And I, I can't explain that, but it happens. Um, a third party can also help you avoid rabbit holes. And, you know, we've seen this many times either with staff or with volunteers where um, you're talking about the walk, you're working on the walk, and they want to talk about the copy machine. And you're like, we're not talking about the copy machine. We don't want to talk about the copy machine. So what we want them to do is to stay focused. And uh, lastly, it's, you know, be prepared to let go of some things that you um, are attached to, things that maybe you developed and have ownership of. Uh, be prepared to list, uh, get to let go of things that you're emotionally attached to. You know, we have certain events that we just love or certain things that we love that, we, that we've been involved with for a while, and it may not make sense to do them anymore. And you, excuse me, you have to be ready to let those things go. Um, also, get ready to let go of some of the things that you don't like. And what does that do? That presents another challenge, like, okay, I'm finally getting rid of this golf tournament that I don't like. What am I going to do now? You've got this void. So you've got to step into the void and fill it. So uh, with that, um, that's going to be it for me right now. I'm going to just uh, close with one saying. Um, there was a very great hockey player, Wayne Gretzky. Uh, and they said that the thing that made him great was he didn't skate towards the puck. He skated towards where the puck was going to be. So I hope this helps you a little bit uh, in the fact that uh, hopefully you can skate to where the puck will be. And with that, I'll toss it back to Sally. Uh, thank you so much, um, Frank. And uh, does anybody have any questions? If you have any questions, you are more than welcome to uh, unmute yourself. I'm going to go ahead and stop the share. I will also be um, sending these slides in a PDF format so that you will have them as well. So I'm gonna go ahead and um, stop.
to share here. Okay, does anybody have any uh, questions for Frank? I have a question. Okay. Um, when we were going through the slides, you um, briefly mentioned websites, but didn't address social media. I was wondering what your thoughts were on that. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, yes, I was so focused on, on, on the website. So your social media to me is something that it needs to be assigned to somebody that's going to really keep it going. Because I'll tell you what's, what will, what's a red flag for me is sometimes when I'll see um, there is a healthy stream of Facebook posts and then they stop or Twitter, like there's a healthy dialogue going and then it just stops. Why? The staff member got changed. You got focused on something else and you need to show consistency on that. Um, and also it's can, it can be a pretty fun project to figure out how can we stay relevant? How can we keep our mission out in front of the community by using Twitter or Facebook or whatever? Um, and there's an, there's an organization I'm, um, I'm working with that is uh, classical music and, or not classical, Baroque, Baroque music. And they focus mainly on, uh, on working with Bach. And I said, my gosh, there's so many things that you can post. Like today is Bach's birthday, or this is the day that he published X, Y, Z. You know, there's certain things that you can do that just to stay in front. So the social media, um, if you have someone on staff that that's their thing and you work with them, um, I think that's a great opportunity for you. If not, you have to make it a discipline to keep the conversation going. Thanks. Yeah, thank you, Jackie. Okay, anybody else? Okay, great. Well, thank you so much, Frank. If you have any other questions, you're more than welcome to send those questions to me. Um, I'll go ahead and uh, put my... Right. Um, and my contact information was on there. If anybody yeah. wants to reach out and contact me, that's great. Okay, great. And um, yeah, I'll make sure that you get the, uh, the slide presentation as well. So thank you so much for, um, for coming, Frank, and, uh, you know, just um, sharing your knowledge and experience. And thank you, everybody for showing up and y'all have a great um, lunch and, and a great day. Thanks so much. Thank right. you, Sally. <laughs>